right, hello Zoomcasters, welcome back. It's Tuesday night, it's time for another USA Hockey officiating Zoomcast. Today is Tuesday, February 15th, and uh, we are doing episode 54, which is entitled, You Make the Call. For those of you who have been uh, tried and true, dedicated supporters to the USA Hockey Zoomcast series, you know this is our cult classic episode where we collect and present a series of video clips depicting plays, different situations within our game. And we'll hit everyone, all the participants out there with a follow-up poll just to uh, poll them and, and figure out where their heads are at with, as far as rule interpretations and all that kind of stuff. And then once we get your results, we will, our two panelists as well as myself, We'll uh, discuss the clip, discuss the proper USA Hockey interpretation. And it should be a fun, uh, entertaining hour. It's usually fun and engaging for all the participants. We love uh, bringing this episode uh, back uh, every few weeks for you guys. For those who don't know me, I'm BJ Ringrose, manager of the USA Hockey Officiating Education Program. I do apologize. I don't have a camera. I got some technological difficulties this evening, so I can't have my camera tonight. But given what uh, our topic is and the fact that we're uh, really just putting all the focus on the videos, my uh, basically physical presence when this episode is really not uh, not all that required anyway. So, but that being said, joined with me is two great panelist guests, starting with Ken Radolinski. Ken is from the Atlanta, Georgia area. He's been a USA Hockey official for just over 20 years. He also, in, in addition to his USA Hockey uh, USA Hockey career, he works within the AHL as well as the ECHL as a linesman. And on top of his USA Hockey or his on-ice activity as a uh, linesman and referee on the various levels that he works, he also gives back as a volunteer administrator, both locally and at the national stage. He is a seminar instructor as well as a summer camp director when we do our summer camp series, uh, the, particularly coming up this uh, summer of 2022. Joining Ken Radolinski is Jennifer Cameron. Jenny's from the Northboro, Massachusetts area, which is you know, somewhere west of Boston, a few miles. Uh, also a 20 plus year veteran official for USA Hockey. In addition to her USA Hockey uh, games that she works, she also works as a lines person within the NCAA and the IHF. Uh, I do not believe that she got an IHF assignment this year only because a lot of the women's series uh, of IHF events were canceled this year, unfortunately, but we are looking forward to getting her back out on the ice and having her represent our country back there on the ice uh, on the IHF stage. Also, in addition to those on ice uh, stuff that she does, she is also a volunteer. She uh, volunteers as a local seminar instructor as well as a camp instructor. When we do our women's futures camps and women high performance camps, she comes in as a staff member to teach our participants. So that is our group of panelists. And normally we start every episode, as, as a lot of you know, with a poll that just kind of introduces the topic, kind of picks your brains a little bit to see where you feel. But these episodes are a little bit different. We're going to be doing so much polling after every single clip. We're going to skip that. We're going to dive right into the meat and potatoes of this uh, series, uh, this episode in particular, with a video clip. So I'm going to share the first clip with you all. And uh, as I said, once the clip is shown, we will run a poll and you should have it appear in front of you. Obviously, if you're watching this on demand on YouTube, you won't be able to see that. But if you're here on Zoom, joining us on Zoom, you will be see, able to see that poll pop up and share what your call is. Um, and then uh, at the same time, if you have any questions or comments or anything like that, feel free to use the Q&A feature or the chat feature here in Zoom to share any of those comments. So let's get to it. Okay, that's our first clip, and we're going to launch our very first poll. Poll question, how would you rate this face-off? And you have three answer choices. Excellent, great management of players. Fair, some issues, but still a decent standard. Or poor, poor management of players and unfair. And we'll give you about 10 to 20 seconds to fire your answers in. Okay. That said, we'll share the results. And overall, majority of you, roughly 62% said fair, some issues, but still a decent standard. 35% of you said excellent, great management of players. 
And there was one person out there in the peanut gallery who said this was a poor, poor uh, face off with poor management of players. So let's uh, take this to our panelists. So we'll start with Rads. Rads, what are your thoughts with this clip as you uh, watch this linesman manage this face off? So uh, one, I wish every face off could be this good. Um, I do like the fact that he talked to the winger real quick. Looked like the winger on white was a little close. So he had some verbal communication for him. He backed up 59 there white. And then once he backs up, comes back to the centers, we get a good pause. Uh, looks like white skates could be a little over, but, but really I don't see any advantage gained by either centerman here. And the linesman conducting the faceoff doesn't either. And it looks like this is good and fair. I really like this faceoff. Okay, Jen, anything to add? I agree. I think it's a, a great face off. Um, obviously, communication is key here, right? Talking to the wingers on the outside, setting that that tone, that expectation early on, and then even having that communication there with the centers, letting him know exactly what they want. I mean, there may be some mild kind of minor things to clean up here. Um, but ultimately, you know, I don't think there's any advantage gain. It's pretty equal. Um, and, you know, puck goes down and you have a, a fair face off here. Yeah, the only thing I'll throw in there, my two cents, um, I, I've never really watched much KHL hockey, um, obviously, because it's not really widely available over here in the United States. But uh, that's where these clips came from. And they were shared with me uh, through some of my IHF channels. And I was actually incredibly impressed with how tight they run their face offs, particularly at a pro level. This is, you know, comp on, on a competitive level of the AHL. You know, the, those two leagues kind of compete for the title of second best league in the world next to obviously the NHL. Um, I was really, really impressed with the standard that their linesmen run their face offs at. If, if any league, or any local hockey community can run this good a standard with a, over the course of their games, over the course of the season, they're in for a pretty good, pretty smooth year. But it, it takes a lot of communication, as our panelists uh, said, and uh, holding those players accountable to a consistent standard all through the season. They'll figure it out. You know, basically, if you hold them to that line, they'll figure out where that line is, and they won't cheat because they know that if, if, if they cheat that they're going to get called out for it. So if you uh, – get on them early and both linesmen work consistently uh, on those two teams, they will figure it out. So that we'll go to, as you can see now, to clip number two. This is kind of a three-part series of face-offs clips, and this is the second one. So we'll roll the second one now. Okay, we'll launch our second poll. Pretty simple one. What is the biggest issue with this face-off? Is it a fairness issue or a safety issue? I don't think it'll take too long with this. Okay, with that, pencils down, share the results. 65% of you said this is a safety issue, is the biggest issue with this face-off. And 35%, roughly one third of you said this is a, that fairness is the biggest issue within this face off. So, with that, we'll reshare this and let's take another look at it. Run it again. Start with Jen this time. What are your thoughts here, Jen? So, I mean, obviously we want every drop to be fair, um, but there's also that level of safety, especially on this. Um, if we look at the center white there at his right foot in relationship to where it is on our foot, um, I mean, this screams danger, danger, danger. Um, so there's, I think the line or the linesman does a great job of communication here, uh, setting that expectation that, hey, you know, no one's gonna win in this situation. You know, you're going to get tangled up with me. I'm going to get tangled up with you. So I think having that patience to get that center set the right way, um, you know, maybe even within my own self, maybe I, I correct my stance a little bit. Um, this is a, a fairly wide stance and not that there's anything wrong with that, you know, good core balance here. But again, if we're going to have a, a guy whose toes are going to be right there at that line and within the lines, 
at this point he's kind of cheating but in that initial setup we got to be careful we got to talk them through that because this is just a dangerous play and again no one's going to win in that situation there right there goes right behind that foot that's what we don't want to have happen yeah but okay. don't don't be afraid to uh to talk to the centers here and it's okay to even reset this you know come up at you, the lines person here is in the crouch position it's okay to even come back up and get tall and just have a conversation and say hey your skate here it's right behind my skate i don't want to be slew footed back and, and land and hit my head on the ice here i need you to, to square up better you know whatever you got to do to put yourself in a good position but also for the player too um so make sure we're using that communication uh before we come in yeah communication is critical there and, and again good centers good players they don't want you to get in their way they have their job to do they want to win that face off clearly and cleanly and they don't want any interference so you know your foot possibly being in his way if he wants to pivot or if he needs to uh you know whatever, whatever he needs to do with his feet to ultimately win that draw that's not going to be good for him in the long run so you know, talking to that center and making him aware of what he's potentially doing. You, know, you may have to adjust a little bit. Jen pointed it out really clear. Maybe you have to adjust your game a little bit. And that's just the reality, particularly at the upper levels. Guys have their way. Centermen's have their way of, of setting up for a faceoff. You know, you as a lines person may have to adjust your game a little bit, adjust your foot position a little bit to accommodate that. You know, maybe it takes a little bit more reach with the arm, whatever it is, but ultimately, you need to work with those centers to uh, execute that drop. So thanks guys, we'll move on to the third part of this series. Okay. We'll launch poll number three. Pretty much the same question. What is the biggest issue with this face-off? Fairness or safety? And again, we'll give you about 20 seconds or so to log your answer. Okay, those rolled in pretty quickly. We'll share the results. Overall, 67% said fairness and 33% said safety is the biggest issue with that particular face-off. So we'll pull this up again and take another look at it. Okay, Rads, walk us through this. What do you think? So I'd like to see the, the linesman here maybe have a little bit of a wider stance. Um, when your skates are a little too close together like that, I just find that it's really easy to get taken out. Um, you know, I'm, I might be picking here a little bit on them, but uh, that's me personally. I think a little bit wider, you're going to have a better base and it's going to be a lot harder to get knocked down. Um, I don't really see anything that's not fair about this right here now, except for red. Red's a little, fur, a little far over the dot for me. And as this video rolls a little bit more, you'll start to see red is even leaning over, leaning over, leaning over, waiting for the linesman to drop a puck. Uh, and I'm also concerned with the butt ends right now, with that whip around. And so that's that's something that you'll need to be aware of when you're conducting your face-offs out there is, okay, how's this player coming in? Where's that stick? If this guy wins the draw, how's he going to wind up flipping that stick over? And is it going to possibly hit me in the face? So this is where, like when Jenny said earlier, we might have to position ourselves a little differently too. Um, but right here, I'm probably communicating with Red saying, hey, I need you back a little bit more. You're hovering over the dot. And then once that player resets there and we got a good pause, then I got the puck down. Anything to add, Jen? Yeah, although, um, again, I agree with Kenny. Red needs to back up a little bit, um, make this more of a fair face off. And, you know, a, a phrase I like to say to some players, like every inch matters in, in instances like this. And I think when we set that tone early on in this game and we make those, those directions crystal clear that this is what we're expecting every single time, making that slight minor fix at the beginning here makes a world of difference as this game progresses and you know the temperature gets, gets heated up and gets more intense that these guys will come right in knowing exactly what to expect from you. 
So I think that'd be the only other thing to add here. Um, just set that tone very early on and it'll make it a lot easier for all moving forward. And you raise a good point with the, uh, the feet on the, uh, the red centerman, because you notice that you know, the positioning of their, his feet in relation to the L's versus the positioning of the white player's feet, you know, in relation to the, this is pretty inconsistent between the two. You know, it's one thing if they're over by, they're both over by like an inch or, or so. They're cheating a bit, but no one's got an unfair advantage over the other. Uh, and it's not such an egregious bit of cheating that it's, it's you know, it's ridiculous that you can't let this uh, face off go. But you have one clearly over the line by about two or three inches and the other one's doing his job. And this boils back to that consistency that we're talking with, with with the first clip. You hold that runner, that team red center accountable in this instance. You know, the team white center knows he's getting a fair shake. You're, you're holding the other center accountable to what the standard is. And that's how you maintain that consistency with this tight face-off standard that they've established so far. Okay, that is enough face-offs for now. Next one is an interesting one. Bring that up. Okay, share the poll for this one. Poll questions are going to get a little bit more tricky now. Make your call. Goal and no penalty to the attacking player. Goal and a minor penalty to the attacking player. No goal and no penalty to the attacking player. Or no goal and a minor penalty to the attacking player. And it doesn't matter how many times you put it in the chat comment. No, we will not let you see it again before answering in the poll. Okay, just about all of you who have chimed in at this point. We'll share those results with you. Uh, boiled down to basically two, uh, two options. The overwhelming majority, just over half and 58%, said no goal and a minor penalty to the attacking player. 38% uh, of you said goal and no penalty to the attacking player. So let's take it to our panelists to see what they think. Brads, what do you think here? Well, I got no goal on this. Uh, I've got the goaltender playing his position in the crease, puts the leg in the stick out to make a save on the puck. White winds up making contact with the goaltender. Uh, making a hard play to the net, which again, you'll, you'll hear guys complain about that too. Hey, I'm just making a hard play to the net, but the goaltender still needs to be allowed to play his position. Um, and I, I got a minor penalty for interference there. I don't think that white is intentionally bulldozing the goaltender. So we don't have a charging scenario like USA hockey, uh, would call for, uh, in this instance, it's, uh, he's going hard to the net. Yes, but you can't you can't just barrel into a goaltender uh, anytime you want to. So I, I got a, a minor penalty for interference with no goal. Jen, any extra thoughts? I see the same thing here. Um, the goaltender has the right to his privilege area, has the right to be in that, in that goal crease. He sticks his leg out and, you know, in that brief instance, he may make that initial contact, um, but he's allowed to be, making a save as they say um so that player does make contact i think we've got the minor penalty for interference and to add to what you said kenny um i don't think this was deliberate i don't think this was you know egregious to where we want to call the charging but i this is one where it's tough um that standard is there he's coming hard he wants to get a goal but even without that goalie making that kick save, I think he directly goes right into that crease area and into the path of the goaltender. So no goal, minor penalty for interference. Yeah, and I think... I'll say, go ahead, go ahead BJ. Okay. Uh, I was just um, going to say the, uh, the defending team might try to make that comment that the goaltender initiated the contact by sticking the leg out. You know, looking at the lane, and granted, this is a little difficult to read just because of the quality of video. 
But my feeling here is his skating lane of that attacking player is going to probably take him across the top of the crease anyway. And the goaltender is making a hockey play. If nothing else, he is in the act of playing goal when he sticks his leg out and, and makes that save and kicks that puck out. That's a new term that we uh, officially coined in the USA Hockey Playing Rules glossary that we now have terminology that kind of defines what is the act of playing goal by a goaltender. And I think this falls under that criteria, you know, kicking the leg out, knocking the puck off the stick. He's in the act of playing goal when he kicks his leg out. He inadvertently trips the player. You know, the player has to do everything that he can to avoid that contact. That's just, unfortunately, that's the, that's the standard of enforcement that that attacking player is held to. We're, as attackers, we're always held to a higher standard uh, to avoid contact with the goalkeepers. Goalkeepers can't just run around like crazy, but at the same time, the attackers have the higher standard put upon them. But I agree wholeheartedly with you too that you know this is not necessarily a charge. He doesn't bulldoze this this poor goalkeeper. Uh, it's a good good interference call. His contact essentially takes that goalkeeper out of the way of um, out of the way to to make an effective save against that rebound. What are we going to say, Rads? You know, I was going to say, not only is this important because we have a possible goal, no goal situation, but anytime in any game at almost any level, whenever you have contact with a goaltender, we need to make sure that we're, we're making the calls that are needed. And what we're saying when we make this call is not only, hey, we have no goal here because of the contact, but we also have a minor penalty on this player because it was, it was a little reckless, but I don't want to say that this was... Uh, a reckless endangerment where we need to go like a five in game scenario here. But uh, that player white, when he's coming down the ice does need to know where he is on the ice needs to make sure that they're not taking a pass that fast through the crease. Uh, and, you know, cause if he cuts a little earlier and he's now outside of the crease and the goaltender has to come out to make that contact. Well, now maybe we have something different. Maybe we have contact from initiated by the goaltender or we just have a good goal scenario. You know, so a lot of things need to be going through your head really quickly here. Um, and I even think you see, you know, it, it kind of pans away a little bit. But one of the defensemen on black looks like he's getting ready to push the player that actually just got knocked into the goaltender. So it's a situation that could quickly escalate into something bigger than what we see here. Yeah. And just to clarify, one of the participants asked, you know, should anything be called on the defender who, who appears to rough the player who hit the goaltender? Yeah, we'll address that. Uh, obviously, you know, if that player comes in and cross checks that player, yeah, we'll address the cross or we'll, we'll assess the cross checking penalty or whatever. You know, the key, key thing we're talking about here is the contact with the goaltender. So we're not necessarily dismissing that stuff in the aftermath, but that's not the main point of uh, showing this clip. Now, if we want to watch a roughing clips after the whistle, I can dedicate an entire freaking episode to that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right, move on to the next clip. If you like that last one, you're really going to love this one. Okay, stop the share. Quite a bit to unpack with that one, but let's do our poll first. So the poll, make your call. Goal and no penalty to the attacking players. Goal and minor penalty to the attacking players. No goal and no penalty to the attacking players. No goal and a minor penalty to the attacking players. Don't think it over too much. Just go ahead and uh, put your best guess in there. We're not recording this. We're not gonna publicly release what your answer was during this particular Zoom cast. At the same time, we're not certainly not share, shaming anyone for uh, what their answer is. That's uh, the uh, panelists as we discussed this episode, just before we launched this, we, we agree unanimously. This is probably our toughest clip that we're uh, presenting during this episode. There's just a lot to unpack. All right, poll's done. Share those results. The majority of you, 69% said goal and no penalty to the attacking players. 3% said goal and a minor penalty to the attacking players. 24% said no goal and no penalty to the attacking players. And 3% said no goal and a minor penalty to the attacking players. So with that, we'll stop sharing those results and we'll pull this clip back up. So Rads, what do you think here? So... On this one, I got a good goal. 
And I'll tell you, one of the biggest things for a referee in this scenario is going to be positioning. And I love that on this clip, you can actually see the referee here, which is great. You know, if you're over deep in the corner, this is going to be a tougher sell for you uh, to call this a goal or no goal. Uh, so your positioning is key on this. But what I have here is I do have the net coming off, but I have this shot going in, had that net not come off. And there's a specific situation uh, for you guys to take a look at. Uh, it's actually rule 610 situation seven. And there are three criteria that have to be met in order for this to be a good goal. And there needs to be where there was not enough time for the referee to stop play uh, for the displaced goal before the shot was taken. Uh, the goal has to be deliberately displaced by a defending team player or goalkeeper. And you can see here, we'll let this play a little bit further. I got yellow coming in, knocking that net off. And then I deem that this puck would have undoubtedly gone in the net had it not come off its pegs. And you can see it barely comes off and that puck goes directly into the middle of the net. So this is that one situation where, and it usually happens during a big scrum in front and everybody's battling for a puck uh, when you get this specific situation, rule 610, situation seven. But I got a good goal here. Jen, anything to add? Yeah, the positioning here by the, the low referee, and you can see him right on the edge there, outskirts of this video, uh, is key. Um, being, watching what's going on here, right? Not only am I watching the puck, I'm watching the players here. We've got yellow kind of initially shoving that red player who does a great job of stopping short of the crease, unlike the clip before where he continues that skating lane to drive the, the goalie. In this case, he has that skating lane, but stops short right? And then gets assisted a little bit by yellow. When the goalie gets turned around, again, positioning is key. Yellow's foot twists yellow's goalie right there. This is where that goalie gets that little spin around move, right? So having that position right there down low, huge key. I also love, now we don't necessarily want to always be swooping behind the net, but in certain instances, Sometimes you got to break the mold, go against the grain and get yourself in the best sight line, right? I might not be glued to home base in this situation. I might need to be getting closer to the net. I might need to be going a little bit behind so I can see what's going on. Um, also, depending on the level of game that I'm working here, right? If this is a four official system, knowing that we might have things going down low, I might want to have that pregame conversation with my partner if I'm the ref saying, hey, when we have, you know, scrums in front of the net, we got a lot of players and there's a, a close goal situation. I'm going to be zeroed in a lot on that puck. And as you, the R2, I need you to watch things going on in front too, that pushing and shoving. So just sort of a, an added feature to this, if this were a four official type game to be able to say, hey, I'm going to do my best to see everything in front, but I do need your help from up top too. Um, so, and once again, I'm not quite sure what they had in that moment or situation, but when in doubt, right, call all your partners over to the side, have that conversation. What did you see? Take your time here. We don't need to rush any sort of play. The idea is let's get it right. Let's communicate and then let's move forward. Someone asked about the, uh, interpretation that the net must be knocked off deliberately by a uh, defending player. I'm gonna bring this up one last time and run it through real quick. You know, how do we figure out the intent of the actions of seven? You know, in this case, I mean, yeah, he's making a sweep, but at the same time, he kind of basically backs into the goal frame. And I know that's really, really, really difficult to basically, uh, you know, interpret and figure out what his intentions are. But at the same time, you're just gonna have to go with your best judgment on that. You know, basically, you know, what was the actions of the players there? Did, did his actions, the things he was doing deliberately knock the net off or was basically, was it like a long reach or some sort of accidental contact with the goal frame? With that one, I think that's, uh, I think that, that falls within the spirit and intent of this uh, casebook situation that uh, Rad's brought up, I, I think. He makes a good point with that. And this falls within the criteria of that casebook situation. So anytime you have big situations, common sense. 
all right, uh, uh, usually prevails. And in this particular scenario, to me, everything to me says good goal. That puck would have gone in. The peg, uh, the net just came off before, and I do have contact from yellow coming into that net. But normally, they wouldn't be backing up like that into it. Uh, to me, this just the screen good goal. Uh, someone asked the question, is it best to wait to declare a good goal until after conversations with players in this situation? If you're the referee down on the goal line, uh, I think, you know what, if you're 100% certain that it's a goal, signal a goal. You know, and you as, as the referee down low, you see a, what you believe is a goal, 100% is a goal, then signal the goal. Now, if you want to talk to your players to get an inter and clarification, our playing rules allow that up until the, the following face off, you can communicate with your teammates and see if they saw something different and you have to walk that uh, walk that call back. But, you know, not showing any type of call whatsoever. Well, now, if, if you're unsure, you're unsure how that puck went into the net and you need some help from your partners, then that's perfectly fine to not give a signal. Don't give the washout. Don't give the goal. Don't give a, a, a call until you talk to your players and uh, communicate and ultimately come up with a call between the three of you or, or four of you or two of you if it's a two official system. Any uh, Anything you want to add on there, guys, Ken or uh, Jen? Or? No, I think you nailed that. That's a lot to unpack in that, in that video too. So it's, you know, that's a situation where I could easily see a group getting together, but, you know, BJ hit it on the head too. It, in any call you make, if it's a slash, if it's a hook, if it's a goal, if you feel that it is, you sell that call and you own that call. So if you're down low and you feel that's a good goal, you point that goal and then you give your explanation why you had it as a good goal. Okay, let's move on to the next clip. This is actually arguably my favorite clip in this run. Actually, I take that back. I was thinking of a different one. We were thinking of the same one, BJ. Yep, exactly. Okay, stop that screen share and launch our poll. Okay, here's our poll. Make your call. No penalty, minor penalty for interference, minor plus misconduct penalties for charging, minor plus misconduct penalties for boarding, or a minor penalty for roughing. Okay, we'll wrap up our poll and kind of spread all over the place. The number one answer with 35% said minor plus misconduct penalties for charging. The second most popular answer was minor penalty for roughing, followed uh, you know, just behind with minor penalty, minor plus misconduct penalties for boarding. And then we had a small fringe minority that said minor penalty for interference or no penalty at all. So. There's our answers real briefly. And uh, with that, we'll stop sharing and we'll go back to the clip itself. So Jen, what are your thoughts with this play and uh, what's your call here? I'm here with the uh, the minor plus the, the 10 or misconduct for charging here. I think this guy makes an effort to skate a good length of the ice here, coming in, coming in, accelerating and then making contact with that unsuspecting player. If you look just prior to, right, his, his uh, teammate shoots the puck up the boards there. So this player is completely unsuspecting of that puck, or I'm sorry, of that hit, which is up high, that, that puck's already gone. He's coming in, coming in, makes that contact. He doesn't see that coming. He doesn't even expect to be part of the play at this point. The puck's gone, right? So. Um, for those that maybe, you know, this is tough to see how tight or how dangerous that might have been into the boards. Um, so I think that's why I err on just the charging call here. Um, I don't think he goes violently into the boards here. Um, but I do see where some folks might say that. Um, the other thing too, to just go against, I think, anyone that might have the minor for, for roughing or interference. When I think interference, right, um, oftentimes it can be labeled something else, right? So in this case, is he interfering with this player from going up the boards to go follow up the play into the puck? Yes. But is he 
doing a more egregious act. In this case, yeah, we're gonna label that as charging. He's skating several lengths, he's accelerating through this hit and he's making contact with an unsuspecting player. I think this is an easy minor plus misconduct for major, or I'm sorry, for the charging. Um, Kenny, what do you think? Did I get it right? Yeah, I've got I've got two and ten here. Uh, yeah. To me, this is more than a minor penalty for a few reasons. You talked about the distance traveled, it's at least ten or fifteen feet that he's skating. The player accelerates through the hit. That player also doesn't have the puck. So I mean, once you start getting to like three or four or five different reasons why it's a penalty, it's normally more than a minor. Yeah. Um, and in this one, the angle of the video, you can't really tell how he hits the wall. So for those that said two and ten for boarding. I can get on board with that, you know, no pun intended, but I, I, at minimum here, I've got a two and 10, uh, for charge. Uh, the player doesn't have the puck either. So it's, you know, there, there's just so many different things about it that, that screen penalty. And like you said too, normally when you have interference, sometimes there's other things that you can label it better. Interference to me is more of a positional penalty. I'm impeding a player from getting to the spot that they want to go as opposed to this, where this is a full-on check. And when you have a full-on check, you normally have your roughs, your charges, your boardings, uh, your elbows. There's, there's a little bit more to it than interference. I like two and 10 here. I think that's an outstanding breakdown, guys. And just one little cherry I'll throw on your commentary is uh, you both refer to the fact that number 15 white here, or 16 or 15 or 16, whichever he is, you know, he, ne he never actually has possession of the puck. So we talk about a vulnerable player, a person and a player in a vulnerable position when they're checked. And, and those that's a factor when you go down the road of uh, the de declaration of player safety with regards to body contact and what they're going to call charging, boarding and things like that. A player who doesn't have the puck and he never, ever gets possession of the puck, his teammate there in the corner actually makes this play up the boards. 15, 16 is not expecting to get hit. He has absolutely no reason to believe that he's going to get hit. And now all of a sudden, 34 on Team Blue here comes barrel in from roughly 10 to 15 feet away and then just wrecks him and blows him up. So that's a big distinguishing factor with whether you're going to go with the rough because he doesn't have possession of the puck versus the charge. The fact that he, he goes such a great distance and that contact blows that player up, you have to go 2 and 10 here for, for the charge. All right, we'll move on to our next clip. Okay. All right, we'll stop that screen share and launch our poll for this clip. Make a call, hand pass, offsides, not offsides. Someone asked about that last clip and whether the, there's any reckless endangerment. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily be out of line. Um, keeping in mind the standard you're setting with that, with that particular hit. If you're gonna go five in a game, I'm not necessarily gonna come down in the locker room and start throwing a clipboard around if you're gonna go five in game for a charge or a board there. Um, but keep in mind, the uh, the standard that you're holding the players that those players to particularly if that call is coming early in the game is that the the standard you want to establish maybe at lower levels of the game maybe certainly at a 12 u level yeah you know what maybe you do go to two and or a five in a game just to set a tough standard as far as uh, make maintaining safety out there but higher levels at the tier one level you are you're, you're safe going with a two and ten there uh, with that, we'll wrap up our poll with all of our districts reporting. We'll share our results. 57% of you said offsides on that last play. 40% of you said not offsides. And 3% of you said it was a hand pass. So we'll stop sharing those results and we'll pull that clip back up. And we will start with Jenny Cameron. What do you have here? This is such a good clip. There's a lot of things going on here. Uh, so first we see this player 
grab it out of the air with his hand, right? And kind of bounces over, rides that line. And he's just about to play his own hand pass and he hesitates because he's offside. His, play, his teammates are offside right now. Then his red players, they come, they make contact with that blue line. And for a split second, right there, they are onside. Then red goes in, plays his own hand pass. We should have a great washout call on this. So what could be done a little differently? You know, this lines person, they're on the determining edge of that blue line, right? I can't fault them for that. But in this initial, and if, BJ, if you could maybe rewind it just a, a little bit, we go from it being three players directly in front of him down the line to four players to three again. So we got three, right in this moment, we got four players and then we're back to three players. That's a lot of traffic to try to look through to see this small puck that is on the far side of the ice from him. So I think in this case, recognizing that we've got a group of players, not only right in front of us, straight down the blue line, but we're right there too. Come in a few more feet into that zone, right? Get a better angle, be on more of that determining edge, have your field of vision open up even more. So if he were to maybe come down, I would say, kind of just before that the area there where it says the keg, you know, kind of right in front or right around that T area, I think he's gonna be able to see through those players a lot more clearly, right? This is an exciting play. You got a lot going on, lots of things, but you can't forget the things that matter that put you in that position to ultimately make the right call. I mean, yeah, first period, you, but we don't wanna get these wrong. It's a two to two game, it's tight. We want to be in the best position to make those calls. So I think here, um, Red does a great job. They have the patience, but I do think um, as a line person, that might be one where we have a better sight line and our own hesitation to be able to ultimately make the right call, which in this case, I think should have been the washout. Excellent job, Jenny. Uh, Rats, anything to add on top of that, maybe with regards to the uh, just the overall awareness of the linesman too? Yeah, so no matter what position you, you're into, if you're the referee or the linesman, sometimes you're going to have to battle for the position that you need to get the right sight line. And that's what Jenny was talking about here, too. I like the lines person's initial positioning inside on the determining edge. But then once more players converge, that's where you're going to have to battle. And, and this is how I know I'm, I'm a linesman, too, is that when you first showed this video, I found myself leaning to try to even get a better view, even though I can't, but that's, and it's just, that's, it's bred in me to do that. And so what I'd love to see here is that, that extra step in and that creep to get that better position and to really fight and battle for that position and that sight line to see that, that that play was onside. Cause great patience by the player here. Like, and that's, you know, it's great. Well, Lines person's got the delayed offside, perfect, but you're waiting, waiting, waiting for the patience. And then I'd love to see that fight for that right sight line. And then this is where you can really shine and get that wash out and, and keep this play moving. One of the things you'll hear from officiating coaches at the higher levels of the game is with regards to being puck focused and basically opening up your, your, your vision. Now linesmen, granted as linesmen are, are, the majority of our job really does focus around the puck. We're talking about offsides. It's players' feet in position relative to the position of the puck. We talk about icing. You know, basically where the puck's uh, where the puck's position is relative to the center ice uh, center line and the uh, the goal line as it crosses and or where it passes a defending player and things like that. But it's not outside the realm of possibility that this linesman may have gotten a little over focused with this the, the far end of the ice and this puck coming across and waiting to see if that that winger coming across was going to play the puck was going to make contact with the puck that he might have just dropped his focus to the point where he just didn't even realize that this other uh, attacking player came back and tagged that blue line and that's just getting a little too puck focused a little too uh, focused on the activity around the puck and losing the bigger picture of what's really really going on uh, around the blue line when that play comes across. So. All right. Now that we've hit you with some kind of hard runs, we actually got a really, really simple one. 
So it should be pretty cut and dry for everyone. Okay, stop that and launch our poll. So make your call, minor penalty for high sticking or no penalty, contact due to follow through. And by follow through, I mean the player's stick there, the team red player's stick came up on the follow through as he was making the pass and inadvertently made contact with the uh, team yellow player's face area. All right, we'll cut off the polling and share the results. The overwhelming majority of you at 77% said minor penalty for high sticking. Uh, there were seven of you, roughly about a quarter, 23% that said no penalty due to contact, uh, due to the follow through uh, resulting in the contact. So stop sharing that and we'll pull that clip back up. And Rads, what are your thoughts here? Well. Considering this is a USA Hockey Zoom cast, and these are USA Hockey rules, this is a minor penalty for high sticking. Uh, so USA Hockey does not have the follow through on a shot nullify a high stick here, uh, where it would be a, a legal play. So you have to be in control of your stick at all times. And even though uh, the player, it, it is on the follow through of a shot, USA Hockey, it's still a minor penalty for high sticking. Obviously, it's, it's unintentional, so I, I don't have uh, more than a minor here on this. I don't think this is reckless or dangerous. Red is trying to make a good hockey play by shooting the puck up the ice and just get to stick a little too high. So just minor penalty, high sticking. Yeah, keeping in mind that uh, in the normal USA Hockey Youth rules, they're not wearing visors either. You could easily say there might be a little bit of reckless endangerment. And if this was a junior game or obviously with this with the World Juniors where they're wearing half shields, yeah, that's that's a pretty that's dangerous contact. But in the normal youth and, and girls uh, hockey world, they're all wearing face cages. And that's just basically going to that stick's going to just go off the, the cage itself. Anything else, Jen? Or I think Kenny hit it all. And it's it's pretty straightforward. It's, uh, you know, knowing your USA hockey rule book, knowing the rule here, follow through, whether intentional or not. We got to we got to make the call. OK. With that, we'll just keep plugging along here. Okay, now we're getting to my favorite clip. Okay, we'll launch our poll. Make a call, minor penalty for interference, minor penalty for roughing, minor plus misconduct for charging, or no penalty. For the most part, we seem pretty well split amongst two answer choices. I was really, really interested to see what the results were gonna be with this poll on this clip. Okay, we'll end the poll and share our results. The number one answer at 59% is minor penalty for interference, uh, followed not too far behind by no penalty at 38%. And there was one person in the audience that thought it should be a minor penalty for roughing. So we'll stop the share and pull this clip back up. And Jen, what do you have on this clip? So here I, I see two players going hard, good race for the puck into the corner here. To me, four takes a great angle and pinches blue off, just runs him out of space. I don't see any overt action to, you know, shove him off the puck with whether with his hip, his shoulder, uh, his arm. I think he does a great angle right here. He just pinches that side off. Uh, to me, both players are in pursuit of the puck. I don't think four white changes a skating lane. He doesn't change his speed to directly, you know, cut off 
this player. So I don't see the interference in that sense where, you know, he would completely change his lane, change his speed and just stop a player. Uh, I have a good angle here, good battle, good hard race for the puck. Four uses his positioning, takes advantage of that and wins that race to the puck. They, yeah, they do contact, they both go down. Um, I think they both sort of brace each other for that contact, which, you know, I, I think we're starting to refer to as competitive contact within the USA rulebook here. Um, but I think this is one where it's a good hockey play. There is no intent, no reckless endangerment um, to do something that's outside of playing the puck that's going hard into the corner. Raz, anything to throw in there? Yeah, I've got good competitive contact here. Uh, I've got, uh, you know, if this happens five or six feet before the puck, yeah, we might have an interference here or we might have a roughing penalty here. But you can see four white there. He's close to the puck, stick is down on the ice, still making an attempt to play the puck and actually does a really good job right here. Like if he doesn't fall down right there, he's in a great position to play that puck, which is exactly what you want players to do. I think this is just a good race for a puck. Four has the body position. Uh, which he legally gained and makes good competitive contact there. I, I like this play. And they, cause they, if we call this a penalty, to me, this is a tough standard to hold all game in, in a checking game. Um, players are close. I got everybody's arms are down here. It'd be really difficult for me to want to penalize a player for this. I got a good hockey player. Just do you want to talk about red flags with, with, you talk about the difference between competitive contact and full on body checking. You look at the attention of these two players, both of them like eyes down, puck focused right now. Neither was looking at the other player, trying to line them up, line them up for the hit. The contact ultimately hits because they run out of space. They're coming into the corner and this corner is coming around. And yes, you know what? The team white player throws, gets his arm up just a little bit. That's more of an act of protecting himself while he's trying to make a hockey player because he knows he's, if he doesn't, if he doesn't give the, the, the kind of subtle pushback on the blue player, he's going to get pasted by this blue player into the board. So yeah, he gives a little pushback, but even when he does that, the focus and the attention is still on the puck. And somebody made the two people made comments in the chat. Basically, I would have liked to see the white player make a play on the puck first. Well, he tried and he would have, if the team blue player stick didn't come up and tie a stick up, he had the position, he had the angle, and he would have made that play on that puck if the team blue player didn't get a stick in there and basically tie a stick up. And that's why the team blue player actually ends up playing that puck first. Yeah, because to me, BJ, too, if four white here, if that stick comes up above the knee and then waist and then really like with the stick in the air throws that body into blue, well, now I can say, yes, he's not making an attempt at that puck. I do have, you know, a body check to a player that doesn't have the puck. To me here, though, with that stick being below the knee, and look how close they are at that puck, too. I, I just really think that this is a good, hard, competitive play. And, you know, checking is not out of the game, and body contact is not out of the game. And I, I have good competitive body contact here. Okay, keep for, moving forward here. This is another fun one. Okay, we'll pull up our poll on that clip. Make your call, illegal substitution or no penalty. It's a good play. And we're running about neck and neck right now. Actually, it's split right even 50-50% amongst our participants. All right, with all of our precincts reporting their uh, polling results, we're actually split in a dead tie. 50% of you think that's an illegal play. That's an illegal substitution. And 50% of you say no penalty. 
So let's bring this clip back up and we'll start with Jen. What are your thoughts with this clip? So this is tough. Um, we definitely have a, a very, very sloppy change on the yellow bench. Um, we got people coming and going all at the same time. Um, I think the big thing to watch here as the puck is coming off red stick, it's going straight to that defensive player yellow who has been on the ice. He has been established on the ice. There is no actual advantage gained in this moment. Now that player that is just coming on the ice from the bench, if he's the one that maybe goes straight for that puck, takes that puck, I might have a too many men sort of situation, but in this sense, I think it's a sloppy change, but ultimately not going to be going with the too many players on the ice for this. There's no advantage gained. There was no contact made. There was no deliberate play on the puck by the players exiting or entering the ice, um, in my opinion here, from what I can see. Okay. Rads, anything to share? Yeah, I, I don't have a, a too many men. It's definitely a sloppy change. And this would be one where I know if I'm lying in there, I'm saying, hey, we got to make sure we get those changes tighter. I'm trying to help the referee out in that situation. Um, but if one of the players that came off the ice that actually made the change, came off the bench, made the change and played that puck, like Jenny said, then yeah, I, I probably have a too many men here. But there's a couple things that also factor into it, not just this play, but this is where you got to know the game situation. It's 63 to six right now, the shots in this game. And it's four nothing. Now I know this team is winning and maybe we can even say, all right, we get a penalty here and, and red gets a power play. But unless this is still like, depending on how the changes went earlier in the game too, maybe we have it. But to me, this is just, it's a sloppy change. That's one where I tell them, Hey, you got to tighten it up. And I would even tell them, Hey, if one of your players that jumped the bench played that puck, I got a too many men there all day. I said, the only thing that saved you guys is that the defenseman that was already on the ice was the one that played that puck. And that's, that's the conversation I'd have uh, during uh, probably my next stoppage of play. All right. Really, really well done, everyone, guys. This was, this was great. Um, as you can see, we have reached and uh, almost breached the top of the hour. So we are going to have to wrap this episode up, I'm afraid, as much fun as we are uh, having. Good news is we plan on doing at least one more of these before the uh, season ends. So uh, as we take customarily do, as we wrap up every single Zoomcast, I'm going to share the upcoming schedule. As you can see on the screen there, you can see today we're doing the You Make the Call episode. In two weeks on March 1st, we're going to do our IIHF event special. Scott Zelkin is going to be back in the captain's chair for that episode. He's going to be joined by a couple of our IIHF officials, uh, Nicholas Bergani, Brian Oliver and Sarah Strong, both of them worked upper level IHF events. Nick Bergani was up at the uh, World Men's under uh, World, World Juniors up in Edmonton earlier this year. And Brian Oliver and Sarah Strong are both uh, currently representing uh, USA hockey over on the IHF stage over at the Olympic uh, Games. And uh, they're going to come back and share their experiences and uh, maybe share a little bit about their pathway to uh, getting those opportunities to go over and work uh, the Olympic Games. As you can see after that, on March 15th, we're going to do a topic which uh, should be pretty interesting for everyone, whether you're an on-ice official, whether you're an off-ice uh, local administrator or anything like that. We're going to talk about game assigners and the game assignment process. Certainly a big topic, lots to dive in. Matt Leaf is going to be joined by a couple of assigners uh, from across the country, and they're going to talk about their craft and uh, the insides and outsides of the job. I can honestly say as, as I've done a little assigning myself, it's probably one of the most thankless jobs in uh, the game of ice hockey. Um, so it should be a really, really interesting topic. And we invite you all to, to join us for that uh, topic. And then on uh, March 29th, we're gonna do uh, an episode called Getting Started. And this one's really focused on the level one official. Uh, officials getting in and basically coming into that seminar classroom, getting their registration requirements done, getting equipment, stepping out there on the ice and, and hopefully getting some mentorship on where they can uh, you know, hopefully uh, build success out there. So whether you happen to be a level one official currently this season and, and just want to learn a little bit more about the getting started process 
this, or maybe you're a veteran official that wants to learn a little bit more how you can make the pathway for a starting official, a level one official more successful, we invite you to certainly join, uh, join us for that episode. Uh, if you look off to the right, don't forget to follow us on our social media channels. You can find USA Hockey Officiant on both the Twitter and the Instagram channels. Easy to follow, easy to like, and we always put our own content out there at the same time, occasionally repeat, uh, retweeting and reposting uh, comments that we find on our normal USA Hockey channels. We love to share content. We love your engagement with all of our content that we put out there. And of course, on YouTube, on the USA Hockey YouTube channel, you can watch all of these officiating Zoomcast episodes on demand at any time. So if unfortunately you couldn't join us tonight live, by all means, come join us uh, anytime you want. Just stop at that YouTube channel and watch any of these episodes as they interest you. So just to wrap up, um, there's gonna be a survey coming out. Once we wrap these things up, you should get an email appearing in your inbox with a survey monkey survey, where we just want a little bit of your feedback. Where did we succeed? Where could we, could, where could we have done a little bit better? And of course that topic where you get to throw in your suggestion for a Zoomcast topic. We're always looking for new ideas. We love doing this uh, series every two weeks and we're always looking for new ideas that we can better inform and better engage you, our membership and make this program more successful. If you're a participant joining us for the first time, welcome. I, I really hope that you enjoyed your uh, experience here, your very first Zoomcast, and we hope to see you at future Zoomcasts um, as we continue with this program. If you're one of our diehard veterans that's basically been with us right from the get-go and watching just about every week or every other week as we went to the two-week uh, program this year, thank you so much for your uh, continued support and uh, commitment as a Zoomcaster. Thanks to the panelists, Ken Radolinski and Jenny Cameron. Thank you so much for giving a little bit more of your personal time. You know, it's it's especially getting it towards this part of the season. Um, you know, it's it's the season becomes a grind. We're getting to that the, the doldrums of February. You guys have put in a lot on the ice and off the ice. To ask you guys to give up one more night of your free time is certainly a big ask. And we appreciate that you're uh, willing to uh, join us for this one episode and uh, contribute your thoughts and. Uh, uh, ideas regarding all these clips. So with that, we'll wrap things up. On behalf of the USA Hockey Officiating Program, this is BJ Ringrose saying thank you for your dedication to USA Hockey.